Keller here in Sacramento, John Donovan in Oceanside, California. Mm -hmm. It's our last, possibly our last podcast of the year, unless we're going to do this on Christmas and New Year's. Um, uh, I would like to take a break myself. Yeah. So uh, this is a, this is a this is a time we can look back on uh, all the podcasting we've been doing since May. We started the first of May. Mm -hmm. um, and I also had a topic I, I, I wanted to just get your thoughts on in addition. Okay. I've been talking to a minister friend of mine in the Unity Church, someone who is uh, got his uh, oars in lots of different sides of the boat, if you will. And uh, mm -hmm. I told him about our work and he connected me with a friend of his in Texas who has been doing a men's work for a long time, a guy named uh, Clay Boykin. And uh, Clay and I have been emailing back and forth. We're going to chat next week. Uh, one Because I was telling Mark about how we started this work originally, um, the work I'd been doing with you in a men's group here in Sacramento. And uh, his ears perked up because he made the comment to me that finding an authentic men's work is still difficult to do. And that uh, his buddy Clay is someone who seems to have figured out uh, a powerful work. And uh, this gentleman has a number of uh, uh, podcasts or, or broadcasts on or interviews on uh, YouTube. And I've, I watched a couple of them. And so I was interested in exploring the topic of men's work versus women's work. And from your perspective, what's the plus and minus, or maybe that's not a fair way to put it, just what, what can we do in men's work that we can't do, or what can we do in women's work that we can't do with, in mixed groups? Um, <clears throat> Is that the way to even ask the question? I don't know, but I'm just well, interested in your thoughts about men's work. Um, men's work um is um something that we're coming back to the um civilizations um things before the industrial revolution uh <clears throat> men initiated the young boys and they had their their part in ceremony and ritual uh and they they um supported each other in the in their aspect or their role the men's role in the in the community and um uh, one of my mentors Meladoma Somme came from an indigenous um, culture where um the boys were initiated at say age 13 um uh, taken away from their what they were familiar with, their mother, their family, their childhood, and then initiated into an adult male, which we've lost over the years. Um, and when co-ed groups come together, there's what I know, what, okay, I know what my assumption is and what my experience is, I drop into a role <clears throat> that is specific to being around women. Um, and it's difficult to get into the, um, what, what, what we refer to in men's work as the pit or the shadow. Um, <clears throat> and other men, um, can call, recognize when we're posturing or role playing. And I, I'm saying we're not doing that on purpose. That's a subconscious conditioning that we all, um, have had. In our childhood, um, Ace Adult Children of Alcoholics 12-step group has named it uh, Family of Origin Dysfunction. Um, and it's an estrangement from our emotional body. Um, and it's specific, men are treated a certain way, so there's certain work that can be done with men to, to open that up. Um, I've done retreats with men, and I've done retreats with women and they're, they're unique in that, um, well, I can speak more to my experience as, as the masculine, there's less posturing going on without the women present. Um, in the women's group, 
of course I was leading it. So there was a male presence and it was different than leading men. Um, not so much in the, in the techniques or things we talked about, there was just simply a difference. Um, and reveling in our, well, me reveling in my masculinity and what that brings to the community is important to me as a man. Women reveling in their femininity and what that brings to the community um, <clears throat> is important. So um, men's work is vital. When I was going to ACA, I found a men's meeting. It was once a week and I made it my um, constant uh, to work with men. Um, I've been to a lot of retreats with men and there's certain things that, what do you call it, are is endemic the right word to us? Um, that only we can um, process and witness and be there for each other. And, and then, you know, I've done groups, co-ed groups, and depending on the, the theme or the goal, they work wonders too. Um, I need the support of men. Here, one guy stood up and said, a man doesn't know how to love a woman until he's felt what it feels like to be loved by a man. And when I first heard that, it was confounding and off-putting. And, and what I've come to understand is I get my energetic hit about how to be a man. And I got it from my father. And he had all his role-playing um, dysfunction. And, and that's what I knew. Um, so learning how to hold masculine energy. And it's not so much gender. It, it, there's a difference between gender and energy. Um, I am certainly the gender male. And the masculine energy um, is hooked into and maybe separate from the gender. It's just an energy I hold in the masculine form. Women um, experience their lives through the feminine form and in the feminine energy. And those two together come together to nurture our children so that they can identify themselves where they fit, and find a balance in that. With healthy um, exemplification of masculine feminine. So that's a short version. So um, let me uh, let me give you some thoughts in, in uh, response to what you just what I just heard you say. Um, in our men's group at Christ Unity Church, before you got involved with us, we had actually started out reading a book called "The Way of the Superior Man." Yeah, by a, a guy named David Data. And uh, for those of you who haven't heard of David, his name is spelled D E I D A, but it's pronounced Data. And uh, what I learned from him is that the masculine and, and feminine are part of a continuum of psychological energies, and that while men tend to be oriented to the masculine and women tend to be oriented to the feminine, it's not a hard and fast rule. And some men can be more oriented to the feminine. Some women can be more oriented to the masculine. And it's not related to gay or straight. It's just, it's just part of the universal energetic, psychological soul energy that human beings have and probably mammals have mm -hmm. in general. I don't know a lot of studies that look at that among the great apes or the bonobos or whatever, but probably the findings would be roughly similar. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, that was very helpful to me because I had never heard it expressed I had just always assumed that sex and these energies were the same. Right. Male equals masculine, female equals feminine. And what David David taught, he not only taught this through his work, but we did several workshops with him when we actually got to experience that in our bodies. We got to experience the energetic differences. And um, that was, uh, that was, quite the, those experiences quite bowled me over 
Mm -hmm. because he had developed uh, exercises and ways of helping us um, feel these energies. And he actually taught us that we could call them forth intentionally, mm -hmm. that the masculine and feminine are not, um, uh, that they respond to directive as well as being, uh, you know, living in us innate, innately. Mm -hmm. Um, quite fascinating, quite fascinating. So that brings us back to the part of the value of, for me in our men's work was uh, as a gay man, I found it interesting because it's difficult for me in my life experience to appreciate the male female dynamic because mm. I don't, it doesn't affect me the same way. So my relationship with women in a room full of women is I don't have any of the sexual energy that you might have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so there was value to me uh, as a gay man to be among men, straight and gay uh, or confused. Um, and it helped me learn what you just said also about learning to accept the love of a man that's not necessarily sexually charged. Right. <clears throat> to learn to learn um to experience love um as an unconditional energy that's way beyond anything in the in the conditions of our lives sexuality or uh, even uh family of origin relationships with our parents of so the same sex parent of the opposite sex etc <clears throat> And I found, so we, I did the men's work exclusively for 10 years or so. And I found that once we started bringing women in and we changed it to a, a co-ed experience that I'm glad I did that men's work first. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, we have an opportunity here to set up a men's accountability meeting again. And I'm looking forward to bringing what I've learned by being in the co-ed work for four or five years back into the men's work. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So the other, so the other thing I thought <clears throat> as I was listening to your, your share is I think there's also a stratification that we don't talk about as much, which is age and thinking about an accountability meeting of under forties, for example, versus an accountability meeting of over sixties or 40 to 60. There's something about the wisdom versus the ripeness or the, not the rawness rather of being young, as opposed to the wisdom of being older, that might also be of value to groups by, to meet by, <clears throat> to meet by age. So as a almost 70 year old, I frankly and freely admit it's hard for me to relate to somebody in his 20s or 30s anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't go back to not knowing what I now know. Right. And so um, there might be value. I'm just thinking out loud here, John. There might be value in um, having young folk in a young folks in an accountability meeting that's stratified that way. I don't know. Um. I haven't uh, ever um, thought about that or um, created any groups and peer groups. Um, <clears throat> and what I know about um, peer groups is that um, if everybody in the room is at the same level, they teach each other or exemplify for each other from that level. And that in mixed groups, it, there's... Um, there's a respect that's developed for people with older age and, and uh, the same way that's reciprocal towards the younger. And this information at whatever age is, is not to stifle somebody or create a routine that is like better. It, it's for the authentic self to come out. Um, there are groups of men who do initiation for each other. And it's inclusive from 18 to however old the guy is. And they all come together and they all initiate at their point. If a guy is 20 years old, he initiates as a 20 year old. 
the 70 year old initiates as a 70 year old. So they both need different things. And the, the group dynamic is set up to handle the specific thing, energy coming from the individual, which usually um, encompasses the similarities of being a man. And um, the things that are the innate role-playing misinformation at any age uh, breaks a person through just to simply start experience in their lives. Um, um, it would be fortunate, it would have been fortunate for me to have started experiencing this at 18. And I started at 45, 50. Um, and it was perfect for me. So um, for me to do and be who I am. Um, so uh, it, it's, um, here, and the, the component that intentional living brings to this is the um, logistics of the um, wounding or the subconscious perception of childhood uh, creating avoidant behaviors or patterns of behavior uh, that are um, um, survival patterns that, that we developed as children. Um, also adds another component <clears throat> to where it's a individual personal epiphany or um, enlightenment moment where they go from being um, um, reactors to actors or go from being seen as seeing themselves as being victims or at anybody's mercy at other people maybe authority figures mercy as being the actor or the person that has the capacity to be proactive no matter what the situation is um, and and according to Ken Wilber there's developmental stages that we go through and 20s to 30s is a developmental stage and 30s to 40s and it, there's certain things that we acquire through that experience of youth that that I bring to to my eldership and to my um well, eldership and what makes me who I am and what I have to offer. Um, and half of that life, actually a little bit more than half of that life was in a addiction uh, pattern of um, be, uh, violent communication, emotional, verbal, and physical um, to where I am now. And, and all of it is necessary for me being who I am. Yeah, I didn't conceive of uh, my thought as a either or, but more of a both and. Um, and what triggered my thought was that I think the people that I do accountability practice with who are in our 60s and older would probably find meeting as men and women less essential than we might have in our 30s, 40s, and 50s. So that was just, as I, I was thinking about some of the women that I'm in meetings with, and it's like, I, I can't think of anything I would hide from them anymore. But that presumes that I went through the men's work already. Yeah, yeah. So that was just my thought about that. There's something about just to take a look at. So when our when our work becomes widespread, then it may we may benefit from being in different kinds of groups, accountability groups, so that we we can have a horizontal learning where we have people from. 15 to 85 and then a vertical one where we're learning in our own age or our own sex or whatever mm -hmm. so that there's so that you get you sort of get the cross yeah you get the vertical and horizontal integrated experience mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm glad you're looking forward to what what we're gonna what's coming to us because it is it's it's yeah. catching on it's like um and that's what I see these podcasts that you and I are doing is building a um, framework or a foundation, a body of work that people can refer to um, along with the, either the group meetings or the one-on-ones or the uh, training for facilitators or however it looks. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's very exciting. Well, and the, uh, it's much like the Wilbur work. I see the accountability work, uh, uh, 
kind of like I heard you say a few minutes ago, it's, um, it's universally applicable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter um, because it's not designed to create an outcome so much as it is designed to facilitate an inquiry. Exactly. And it is a um, dynamic set of material that continues to be added to. Exactly, because we're continuing to discover uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think you and I have discussed this before on this, this podcast. If not, I'll bring it up right now, is that um, each human being behaves as if we were an entire universe. And we can get into the... We can get in the possibility there's only really one universe, but for, for our purposes, each of us is inside as big as the universe. Mm. So the implication there is that there's no end to what we can learn and discover in this ginormous universe whose limits we can't possibly even glimpse. Right. And so that uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with uh, uh, oceans of possibility, infinitudes of possibility in each one of us. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, ways that we can then come out of the internal inquiry to create something on the outside are also infinite and varied. And the difference is each day I create my life, I'm adding to what I already knew or already mm -hmm. experienced. Mm -hmm. And it's a new, it's a, what, what Wilbur calls, it's an emergence. It's something that didn't exist before. And that quality is changes everything that went before. I've seen you do that in the meetings when you, um, in your, your famous, I say this famous for people that haven't been to any of your meetings with you yet, but when you ask the, when you say uh, everything that you've ever said, done, or thought, and everything you've never said, done, or thought are contributing to what's in your way or something, I forget your, yeah. your formula. Yeah. And then you turn, you walk some people, you walk people through a little bit of that. Then you turn around and say, now everything has changed and none of that, none of that's true anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, I tell them everything you think, say, and do, choose not to think, not say, not to do, <clears throat> is actually what's keeping you from having what it is you say right. you, you want that you don't have. <clears throat> and then I ask them, how do you feel? And I work with in the body sensation, whether it's in the chest, the arms, the shoulders, the stomach. And they simply pay attention to that sensation in their body, which adds to the total mass of their information and changes it, maybe minutely, maybe greatly. I, I'm, I'm just not my thing to judge that. And now what I said, everything you think, say, and do, choose not think, not say, not do, is no longer true because you've added. Right. You've added to yourself. And right. you, you do that through your emotional body. That's how we grow and mature, right? Emotional body, um, and then that st either starts a conversation or they think, "Oh, that that's sweet," and move on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. What time does the bar open? Right. Yeah. What time does the bar open? And it's okay. It's all it's all okay because everybody has their journey, and and um, it is my intent to honor each. Right. Not not to dictate what they might be. Well, and then another way to, to consider what you just said is that not only does each person have his or her own journey, but humanity has its journey, and the human journey includes all of those individual journeys. They're all <clears throat> an essential part of the human journey. Right, and they're inextricably linked. Yep. Well, we might even say they're one and the same thing, but that's, again, that's advanced spirituality. That gets us to mysticism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's only one thing going on. But that's how you can say, as you have also said, I believe that when I heal now, that I heal all who have come before me. Or so, Again, I forget your yep. words. Mm -hmm. Because in, in that mystical unity that is the one thing behind all the seeming multiple multiplicity, everything, everything is always present everywhere at the same time. Right. So we say in our unity church, there's there's only one thing going on. It's God. The divine substance is there's only that's the only thing going on. And therefore it it touches everything simultaneously all the time. Yes. And um, 
Yeah. All those that come before me are healed. When I heal in this moment, all those that come before me are healed. All those that come after me are right. healed in this moment. Right. Um, and I don't really have to understand that. Just I say it and I feel it and know it and then let it go. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's again why I, I'm so grateful for um, learning the power of the emotional body as the conveyor of wisdom and information mm -hmm. because i i cannot trust my intellectual mind to get me there right so and and, and actually your intellectual mind was not designed to get you there it was right. to get you around here exactly. <laughs> survive in this environment if you if you see something that's dangerous move away that that's what our intellectual minds designed to do. And yet we assign it the task of getting us someplace else, which is not its job. That's the heart job, the, um, the full body job or the full body being mind, body, spirit, acting in, in uh, coherence um, and moving us, keeping us safe. Our mind keeps us safe. We know what is dangerous and what is not for the most part. Um, and then our, our connection to our heart space opens us up to this wider, broader world where survival isn't the only goal, where um, thriving and uh, contributing and being is and available creating. to us. And creating is available to us, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you notice it, John, but you just, again, you just described the cross. This is, that's why Christian symbolism is way more than most people think. Yeah. Again, the verticality of the integration of body, mind, soul. Yes. And the, then the horizontality of, you know, where, where I am in this place and time. Watch out for the snake. And they're all the same. Yeah. And, and then right where they intersect. Yep. That's the integration. That's where you can say, the the infinite and the finite are one actually that's where i found myself saying i am right yeah exactly yeah and so the the uh mystical value of accountability practice is that it helps us it helps me with that inquiry that that the, the great uh, indian hindu sage said ramana maharshi said there's only one question worth asking, and that is, who am I? Mm -hmm. And so how do we answer that question? Accountability helps me answer that question because it takes it out of the realm of mere intellectual uh, dalliance mm -hmm. and into the embodied experience of the I. Right. And the embodied experience is always only present. It's never yesterday or tomorrow. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's beyond the thinking mind. Correct. Yes. Yeah. The thinking mind merely reflects on the experience and gives it a name. What it already knows. What it, and it's already happened. And it's already happened out of the past. So I can sit here now and reflect on how I felt three seconds ago, but I'm always yeah. feeling in the, in, the, in the present moment. Right. And yeah. my mind's always commenting on it after it's already happened. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, new feeling has emerged. And, and, and along with that, in the meantime, um, who are you, where are you, and what do you want? And let's, let's, all, let's start the journey. Wherever you're at, that's, that's the place. Um, whether the, and to give an example of wherever you're at, where I found myself at one point was, I'm a violent man. Is my intent to be nonviolent or is my intent to live in peace? And I started from there. I didn't. I didn't go. Oh, I'm all that right now. It's like, oh wow, I'm I'm a violent man, which created this coherence. And it is my intent to be loving, caring, nurturing, spouse, father, and participant in my community. Um, and that moved me towards that. And I built a, a a foundation to hold the rest of what was coming, because if I get it all now and I don't have the foundation, I, it I'll. I'll tip over or implode or um, um, burst into something. I don't know. I can't hold it. And that's actually been one of my intents is the hold is to build the capacity for unconditional compassion, for unconditional love. 
um, cause, and that's a work in progress. Well, the value of accountability practice then picking up on what I he heard you just say is that <clears throat> accountability practice helps me realize when I'm applying conditions so that I can set the intention for the unconditionality. Yes. So we, we were born in a world of conditionality, even though the world of conditionality floats on an ocean of unconditional love and perfection. Right. And somehow this thing was designed for us to notice when it's not working in order to get to where it works. Yes. So I notice when I'm in my family of origin, self-violence that then becomes violence toward others. And in noticing that, and I get that alignment that you were just talking about, okay, that's the truth. I'm being cruel yeah. to my best friend. I'm being cruel to my wife. I'm being cruel to my partner. I'm being cruel to myself. And just be with the emotional emotion that comes from realizing that that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. And in that emotion, whatever it is, shame, sadness, fear, ask myself, ask where that feeling is showing up in my body, what do I want? And for me, this practice I've learned is let that answer come spontaneously. Yes. Like, I don't know what I want till I ask. Right. But when I'm in that emotional truth, I, I, I hardly ever don't get an answer to the right. question. Right. And it comes out of you, it comes through you. Right. Instead right. of figuring it out. Right. I remember when I first started doing this work with you that I, I learned to do that and that the answer would show up and my mind would go, what? Mm -hmm. That's what I want? Yeah. I thought I wanted a new car. Yeah. All right. Why not everybody like me? Right. Yeah. That was mine. Yeah. But it didn't take me long to really realize and appreciate the wisdom of the body. Yes. It's like, if my body says, I want peace and ease, then I'm going with that. Yeah. Yeah. Then I'm going with that. I don't care what my head says. Right. My head will, my, my intellectual mind will actually enjoy peace and ease. I promise it. Yeah. And that's another reason why the, the practice is so powerful because it's grounded in present moment feeling states. Yeah. And as I share in the, in our rusty nail groups, part of the value of this is we're always in a chain. We're in an, I'm living in an ever changing feeling state. So there's always a feeling with which to work. Yeah. And it may not and be very intense. Most of the time it's not intense but it's still there because mm -hmm. I have a body and the body is always vibrating and dynamic. Blood is moving through it. Nerves are transmitting mission, uh, messages up and down the whole system, the vagus yep. nerve, all that stuff. It's going on all the time. Yep. And you have a hormonal system and a glandular system and a, that all work in unison and balance. Yep. Yep. And we have a mind that's capable of like blotting out feeling any of it. That's right. It's really powerful. Yeah. And um, sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes we do need to blot it out. We did it. I did as a child needed to blot out the, the um, trauma that was happening to me so that I could survive. It served me. Right. My body, my body is in service to me. It kept me alive through my childhood only it forgot it, or it didn't even inquire that I no longer need that, that uh, hypersensitivity or that capacity to shut down and not feel and not see and go away and be invisible in, in a crowd. Um, it was no longer in service to my well-being, but it didn't know that because I didn't direct it. I didn't validate it. Thank you for keeping me alive. And um, now I want to thrive. It is my intent to thrive. Um, it's this mechanism is a survival mechanism and it simply says yes. So as a child shutting down, uh, disassociating or associating someplace else, however you put that, um, is the technique that it used to keep me safe. So something happens in my adult life, 
I shut down and go into that space and I'm safe, although it's harmful to me, harmful to people around me, it hurts, it's sad, it's devastating, it's causing my demise, it's causing disease and stress. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not its worry that that's happening, it, it's charges to keep me alive and it's done it. Um, until I inform it through this coherent place of truth to, to do something different to thank you for shutting me down. It is my intent to be free. It is my intent to thrive. It is my intent to be gentle. Um, that new directive starts another thing in process where that is available to me now. It was a couple months ago, I, I heard you start saying, and you might've been saying this for a while, John, but I heard you say it for the first time, I'm reveling in my character defects. Yeah. And another way to say that is, this is now my word is I'm befriending my defense mechanisms and I'm defending, I'm befriending all those things that in the past I denounced as compulsions and irritations and obstacles. I don't want to, I don't want to exile any part of myself. I want to befriend all of it. Yes. And I learned that through doing this work. Mm -hmm. And on a crude basis, I can say part of the way I learned it is that I couldn't get rid of any of it. <laughs> yeah no yeah. matter how i tried yeah to be a good boy yes. and feel the way i'm supposed to feel it doesn't doesn't work that way so right. at some point i said you know what since this is all part of me then i want to accept myself just the way i am that's the way it started i accept myself just the way i am and it moved from mere acceptance to embrace yes and and ultimately delight Yes. Like I delight in my character defects because they're, they're me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is what you didn't get from your exactly. family of origin, which you are now capable of giving yourself only the technique and the practice and is elusive. It's like counterintuitive, embrace my character defect, revel in my character defects. It's like, what? what? No. <laughs> and um, I thought you quit then, drinking. Yeah. And then being, being in gratitude right. to the, I want to say, monster that's been haunting me, instead of seeing it as a monster, seeing it as something, some thing that's been um, interested in my well-being, although misguided. Um, and gratitude for the shutdown. Um, oh, here it is again. I'm about, I'm shutting down, uh, and then being in gratitude instead of going, "Why did I do that again? How come that always happens to me? I thought I should be beyond past this shit." Come on, John. What are you doing? Just, just quit that. And, and I and I find myself in gratitude for this, for this frenetic uh, feeling of of dread of what did I do? Why did I? How come I said that? How come I said that? To go, oh. Oh, and and just thank you, thank you, thank you for coming again. Thank you, I appreciate you. And the feeling I got from that exercise was this relief. It's like, it's like, I don't know what it's like. It's new. It's um, it's a feeling of um, being nurtured. I'm, I'm offering that to myself. Um, which I want to offer, I did not get, I don't want to say I didn't get any, because I certainly did. And and everything was on, on a condition, on a conditional or, um, I don't know. You know, when you were, uh, you were reaching for what it's like um, that a minute ago, it's like, it's like, yeah. you know, it popped in my mind was, uh, it's like a baby at his mother's breast. Yes. Yes. Nurtured, Satiated. safe, warm. Yep. In, an, in, a, in a moment of unconditionality. Safe. So I agree with you. We, I certainly experienced wonderful things as a little kid, as a little infant in a dysfunctional family with uh, parents who were in their early 20s that were drinking and had their second kid die and their fourth kid die in infancy. I mean, just all kinds of stuff that just, you know, 
affected you? This little kid had to react to without, yep. had didn't have the information that didn't have the option to do other things. Um, but I, I think I've shared with you before, my, my dad's parents were, I was their oldest grandchild and they treated me royally. And I got to go spend two weeks every summer with them. And I got to experience what it's like growing up to have unconditionality. Yeah. Even if it was just for two weeks, it made a difference. Yes. Yeah. I received that from my grandmother too. And yeah. so I still, you know, I still think of them with great fondness. My grandparents, they've been gone a long time now, but they're not gone from my heart. Right. They're the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Yeah, they are. But the same little boy who created the defenses against the trauma also opened up and allowed that love to come in. Yes. So that was all me. This is all, it's all of us. We're this interesting per, semi permeable emotional membrane that lets in the good and tries to keep out the bad. We just don't have the mechanism to discern how to use that and how to befriend particularly the tough stuff. That's what we can do now as we've gotten older and we, we realize that those fear responses are the response of a little kid, not a response of what's going on in my life right now. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Someone in our meeting last night was talking about um, that feeling that there's another shoe about to drop. Yeah. Sort of a sort of a uh, an un unspecific dread, and I used to have that all the time, and it's I don't have it anymore. So I intend to live. I intend to live a life of joy, peace, freedom, and community. And so I don't have room for existential dread. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I know that, uh, I know that the process works. It, 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 it is um, such a, a blessing. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for um, having received this information and specifically in a place where I can offer it back. So, yeah, very grateful. So do you, uh, we've got a few minutes left here. Do you have any reflections on uh, this year as we've, not just you and I working together, but the, all the other work that you've done and uh, this, this accountability work? down there at the clinic and online and doing ACA Zoom conferences? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, now that when I, every time I look at the calendar, I go, holy cow, it's already, and then name the date. And, and today happens to be the 18th of December um, at the end of the year. And yet I've, I've felt this um, length and breadth of living over the last year that was simply phenomenal. I mean, it, it's, it's like I'm, ex I'm experiencing two different things. When I look at the calendar, I go, oh, time flies. And my experience of the time has been um, something that has been full and abundant and, and challenging and um, asking me to step up at times and, and or being there for somebody else when they needed somebody to to, to look to or reach to. Um, um, it's a really um, good feeling um, that is paradoxical at the same time. It's like time's flying, that year just flew by, and yet I gained so much from 2020 with um, COVID and Zoom and time to to reflect and contemplate and and to a lot of zone out you know i'll, I'll binge watch a, a series that i find interesting or i'm into the sci-fi thing so i'll watch it for like two days and then go oh oh my god that's two days i've been watching this be the guy anyway and enjoying my life enjoying my um my daughters and my grandson and my job this podcast we've created, I don't know now, 19, 20 podcasts that is a um, um, body of work that, that is there for, for people to, to look at and um, have. Um, plus I've um, gotten to the point where 
I'm, I'm, I'm hired a, an assistant, which is, you know, in, from my family of origin, that that is like, what, what, what are you doing? You don't want to give people your money. It's like, or, you know, who do you think you are? Well, I know who I am and I need help. So uh, the best way to do it is to hire somebody that's like-minded and, and loves the work too. And it's just a blessing for both of us. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to book workshops for next year. I'm gonna sit down with my assistant and create a schedule um, and, and do this work, be available. You know, that reminds me of something I wanted to ask you to consider. Uh, so as we keep um, improving the work, we mm -hmm. had a conversation in our uh, meeting last night about the accountability rope. Uh, and uh, I'd like you to consider putting a chapter in the workbook on that. The, the end of my accountability rope? Uh, yeah. yeah so, so we have a we have somebody who's dealing with the challenges of a spouse of 40 years and uh, the gap that gets created when one person is moving in one direction and the other is moving in a different direction. And uh, we talked a little bit about you know, what the accountability rope, I use the definition I learned from you. It may not be yours exactly, but um, she found it very helpful. Good. To, Good. You know, uh, that, that I sounds keep asking, I keep asking myself, what's my role in this? And when I've cleaned up all of it, then I'm at the end of my accountability rope. And that's where I found clarity. This is what I want. Right. This is right. what I need. Would you be willing to do and then then accepting right. the answer and moving from there right N not taking it personal not going oh my god i did all this for you it's just it's yeah. clear there's a clarity that comes that is um about people talk a lot about setting boundaries well until i came to the end of my accountability rope i was demanding or hedging the bet or doing all kinds of things except setting clear boundaries Right. And um, clear boundaries are awesome because people hear them. They, they, they cannot not hear them. And then accountability is actually a, a process by which we do that. Again, it's another part of the value of the practice. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm learning about myself. Exactly. Yeah. So one other thing I wanted to put on the table before we wrap up. <clears throat> Again, I've said this before. For me, doing this work has been immensely helped by having uh, somebody, uh, a, a therapist who is ex expert in healing childhood trauma to work with her at the same time because these energies as we've discussed are in the emotional body and there are techniques for healing emotional body trauma that don't necessarily involve talking about them. Right. Or don't, or even in accountability when I can get, when I can get aware of some of those repressed feelings that doesn't necessarily all by itself lead to healing it can mm -hmm. over time but i found working with uh, a therapist that um who just she has the expertise in helping heal the the traumas which which we've defined here is uh um, unexpressed or repressed emotional energy yeah and what I found, some of the unrepressed emotional energy is like really coiled up in there. And it yeah. takes some time and some expertise to help uh, uncoil it. Yes. So for me, uh, maybe other people don't need to do this work, but for me, it's been immensely helpful to do them both simultaneously. Yeah. As, as I have done in my journey. And I work with people and I can just see because the, my observations, people keep coming back to the same stumbling block, the same emotional stumbling block. And I just sit there and I say, have you considered getting therapeutic help for that? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I can't help you on this one. Right. I don't have the expertise, but it's out there. And, yeah. you know, most it's interesting. Well, I, I won't say anything more. So just being able to give people that option to consider that just in everything in my life, there are things that other people can do better. I can ask them to help me. Right. 
There's no shame in the fact that I don't know how to heal my own trauma. Um, there's several modalities that I found to be effective, and, and one of them is Peter Levine's somatic experiencing, and he trains therapists in this technique, right. somatic experiencing. The other one I've experienced is EMDR, yep. which is powerful. Um, I've heard lately that it's most effective with specific event trauma rather than the global trauma of childhood, although I found it effective in both areas of my life. Um, and there's another technique that I haven't tried that is a version of EMDR brain spotting, which uh, I've heard a lot of good things about it. And I've done it, brain spotting and it's, it, it's okay. very powerful, but I wouldn't do it without a therapist who knows how to support because brain spotting is a way to actually hook directly okay. into the original trauma. Right. Know? It's like, don't go there on your own. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, it is very powerful. Very mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. So, and then, you know, there's all kinds of other things that, that I've experienced and gone through that have contributed to my growth. Right. Uh, talk therapy, um, um, workshops, um, experiential type workshops have all contributed to to my growth, along with the 12-step work, the intentional living work, absolutely. Yeah. So. But I notice that, so my reflection on this year is that um, there's been, particularly in the last three or four months, there's been an accelerating shift of underlying energy for me, of uh, a continued relaxation of tension and fear and the opposite lifting of joy and peace, particularly peace and ease, serenity. And it's characterized by just more and more people reaching out and asking me if, I, if, if they can talk to me. Yeah. yeah. And, and my response is, sure. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, um, William Glasser, the um, founder of um, reality therapy said that the greatest human need was the need to be needed um, and and having something somebody else wants and asking you for it is is it's a it feels really really good yeah that I contribute that I that I have something to offer somebody rather than you know stop it or quit doing that or right um, well, and just to be able to support someone without feeling the need to give advice, that's a, that's a major thing to uh, be able to let go of. Yes. Like, I really don't know. I don't know for you, but, you know, I'm willing to help you ask questions for yourself that might lead you somewhere. Right. And, and a big component of intentional living <clears throat> is, is to create a, that starting base point for people to, to explore what they need and explore their, their uh, passions and their, their special needs or their special um, proclivities and, and then find their, their way. It's like the, the, the demarcation, it's like the launch pad of the rocket. And if that's not in order, then everything's confusing. So it's a, it's a place to start from. Um, and, um, continue in i mean it's a it's a big part of my life and it's become a big part of uh, a lot of people i know their lives um is that i'm accountable for my behavior another way to say that is responsible i've become responsible and by that i mean i have the ability to respond to what's happening in my environment instead of react and that's a that's a put people light years ahead of most other people's ability to respond. And, um, and that doesn't mean being weak or not saying anything or being a doormat or being milk toast. It means having your center and responding from that and, and being proactive for yourself. Um, well, I think you also mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you mean responding consciously. Yes, yeah. So responding out of choice not out of compulsion. Correct. Yeah, no, that's, that's all the difference in the world. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, on that note, mm -hmm. I want to wish you and yours a Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you, Marty. I look forward to resuming this in 2021. That's, yeah. It'll actually be the first, right? The next Friday or the Friday after Christmas is the first. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be available. Do you want to say anything about the, your new meeting or not yet? Uh, not yet. Okay. Tentatively, after the first of the year, sometime 8.30 Saturday morning, Zoom meeting. Um, I'm going to get with Marty to figure out how he sends out all the invites and figure that out. Got a lot to figure out. Okay. Okay. So as always, for those of you who are here for the first time, if you want to know more about our work, our contact information will be on the screen after the podcast is over. Uh, I facilitate a Rusty Nail Club meeting, which is just our smart ass name for this work that we do. Um, I think John's got a different smart ass name for his uh, work coming up, something about mm -hmm. digging in the dirt or something. Mm -hmm. um, but we do that uh, Monday nights and Thursday nights at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, people are welcome. We we have somebody, as I've said before, coming into us occasionally from Dubai, which is mm -hmm. 12 hours ahead. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a worldwide practice. Uh, John also does one-on-one -on -one work. And so our contact information is going to be coming up here on the screen in just another minute or so. So John, I look forward to working with you in this upcoming year. And uh, I wouldn't even begin to guess what that's going to reveal for us. I'm excited. I'm excited and expectant. I'd say amen. Okay. Thanks, Thanks John. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye.